Welcome to chapter 26 and welcome back to module 6. We'll be talking in this chapter about different types of galaxies and in this particular video we're going to introduce to how we figured out that there even were galaxies outside of our own. So we start by introducing in a more complete way the Messier catalog. Now we had talked briefly about these Messier objects in the first project that we did for this course. But Charles Messier made a catalog of objects that he could see through his 1700s era telescope that were pretty much in the way of him searching for new comets. So the idea behind this catalog are these are somewhat fuzzy objects that a low powered telescope can tell aren't just a single star, that aren't planets, because we know how those planets move through the sky, planets are known since ancient Greece, and that weren't comets, because comets change where they are over the course of several days or weeks, and these are objects that are always in the same patch of sky. When we introduced them in the Module 1 project, they were because we were researching a single constellation, and these Messier objects are in that patch of sky. Now if we look at this set of objects, 110 different objects, we see that most of them are star clusters. We have several dozen open clusters of dozens or hundreds of stars. We have several dozen globular clusters, these big collections of hundreds of thousands of stars. And then there is a handful of um, nebulae and galaxies. About half of these, a third to a half of these, are galaxies. And we know that they are galaxies just from our 21st century knowledge of that spiral structure uh, we saw in the previous uh, slides for chapter 25 and the structure of the Milky Way galaxy. But even before taking this class, if someone showed us a picture of a spiral galaxy, we'd be able to say, yeah, that's a galaxy even if we aren't really um, understanding where galaxies form or how big they truly are, we recognize that object. But if we put ourselves back into the 1700s and saw these objects through Messier's eyes, these were just nebulae that had a spiral structure to them. They were called spiral nebulae. And so part of the discovery of other galaxies is being able to recognize that these are not small clouds within our own Milky Way galaxy, but much larger structures that rival the size of our own that are just at drastically farther distances than we've ever really encountered before, that no one had ever measured before. So up until this point in the semester, we've actually discussed most of the objects that are in the Messier catalog. We talked about the two different types of star clusters back in chapter 22. The phrase diffuse nebulae we didn't really talk about, but we did talk about emission nebulae and dark nebulae and reflection nebulae in chapter um, 20. Planetary nebulae came up when we talked about how low mass stars die. They give off their outer layers, kind of puff them off into this planetary nebula kind of way. Four of those are visible with a kind of low powered backyard telescope in the Messier catalog. And then there are 40 galaxies, which we know about. Um, now, when we go back even just a hundred years, galaxies were still called nebulae in the 1910s, 1920s, because we didn't have a way to get the distances to them. If we don't have a distance to an object, it is hard for us to know whether it is a small object close up or a big object far away. Imagine, for example, taking a little Hot Wheels car and holding it near your eyes. It might actually take up just as much field of view as a real car that's parked several blocks away. So it was a big, source of conflict, and so much so that there was a great debate held in 1920 between Harlow Shapley, who had done the work to map out the Milky Way globular clusters, we talked about that in chapter 25, um, and Haber Curtis, who is a local to Michigan. He was born in Muskegon, and Haber Curtis was convinced that even though we have started to map out our galaxy, that 
didn't mean that we were mapping out the entire universe. So there was a great debate um, held in 1920. So like two podia on a, um, in a town hall kind of format and they kind of presented their case. And really what it came down to are these two statements. They're very much simplified and summarized. But Harlow Shapley's main point was that we were near the edge of the Milky Way galaxy that he had just been mapping out, but that the Milky Way galaxy is huge and contains all of these spiral nebulae structures from the Messier catalog. Heber Curtis's idea was that we're near the center of a very small Milky Way structure. Um, he didn't agree with Shapley's map and said that a lot of the stuff he was mapping was already other galaxies outside of ours. So a pause and think question, who do we agree with, if either, and why? So think through this and pause the video. You may have picked either scientist and hopefully had a reason for what part of their statement made sense to you. But the problem is in 1920, there was not enough evidence gathered to make a fully complete hypothesis. Both of these men had partly the right idea and partly very much the wrong idea. Shapley is correct that we're kind of closer to the edge of the Milky Way galaxy, but those are not spiral nebulae within our own. Those are other galaxies. Haber Curtis is correct that those are outside of the Milky Way galaxy, but he is wrong that we are near the center. We are nowhere close to the central bulge of the Milky Way galaxy. Our sky would be a lot brighter if that were the case. And so the great debate ended with nobody really winning and everyone kind of frustrated. And it took three full years before a new piece of evidence was gathered that really helped figure out what was going on. And that was with when Edwin Hubble identified a Cepheid variable in Andromeda Galaxy. Now, as a reminder, we talked about Cepheid variable stars at the beginning of this module when we talked about chapter 25, even though it is a portion of the chapter 19 in the book. Cepheid variable stars have this period luminosity relation. So if you measure how long it is taking, taking them to get bright and dim again, you can actually figure out how truly intrinsically bright they are and then compare that with how bright they appear to be. Now, Doing this in a galaxy outside of our own is extremely difficult. And when Edwin Hubble was working on this, the period luminosity relation was still somewhat new and hadn't been fully correctly calibrated. But he identified what he had originally thought was a nova. So in the bottom right of our slide here, there's N listed for a couple of things. Edwin Hubble was looking at nova. We talked about those briefly when we talked about um, a white dwarf in a binary system. But as he was making follow-up observations, he realized that one of them was actually a variable star that was getting brighter and dimmer um, in measurable ways. Now, his calculation using this new Cepheid um, period luminosity relation was that the Andromeda Nebula was 900,000 light years away from us. That was enough at the time, in 1923, for everyone to agree that this was not in our own galaxy. We actually now know that Andromeda is two and a half million light years away from us. Very similar to the Milky Way, it is a spiral galaxy. It is one of the closest large galaxies to the Milky Way. But we want to make sure we understand, now that we know that other galaxies exist, we want to understand what types of galaxies are out there and which ones are common or uncommon. So let's start with one of the Messier catalog objects, M51. I have an image here taken by um, my own students back in 2014, uh, students that I was a teaching fellow for. Um, on top of a campus um, science building in Cambridge, Massachusetts. So we had um, some extra time in the night lab that we were doing, and so we took this picture. We didn't do anything fancy with it. We're just collecting um, broadband visible light. And so if you looked through the telescope, you would see something similar to this. 
There is structure there, and if you're having trouble, you can kind of pause and kind of look at it out of the corner of your eye. But it is hard to see what's going on with it. We can tell why it took a while to decide that these weren't nebulae, um, but are instead galaxies. Okay, fast forward to um, the very best te telescopes that we have available to us. The Hubble Space Telescope can do a whole lot better than a backyard telescope can or in the example of the previous one, a somewhat high quality telescope, but under extremely poor light pollution conditions because we're right across the river from Boston. Hubble Space Telescope also has the advantage that it is using multiple wavelengths beyond what the human eye can see to enhance and highlight structure. These colors are not what the human eye would be able to see even under the best conditions. And so we want to recognize that when we see these images, they aren't fake, but they are going beyond the wavelengths that our human eyes are limited to seeing. This is one of my favorite galaxies, um, and not just because I've got that kind of side story with it, but just because it's showing such beautiful structure. The Whirlpool Galaxy here is showing us a unbarred spiral structure. It has a central bulge that is circular instead of elongated. And so it is a spiral galaxy that does not have a bar. On the other hand, NGC 1300, no fancy name for this one, um, and it's in a different catalog than the Messier catalog. This is a really classic example of an extremely barred spiral galaxy. Much more extreme and elongated than our own Milky Way galaxy, but it is worth noting that our galaxy, the Milky Way, is a barred spiral like this one um, and not a um, standard spiral like the previous picture. It's also worth noting that we can identify spiral galaxies even without seeing the spiral themselves because there is more to a spiral galaxy than just seeing the arms. It's the fact that all of the materials in a flat disk and that there's gas and dust available to make stars, all of those are properties of a spiral galaxy. And so we can still identify them when we see them edge on like this NGC 1055. Because the big different type of galaxy, the other common type of galaxy is an elliptical galaxy which has no exciting structure to it. There's a big reason why anytime that you draw a little doodle of a um, galaxy, you're gonna be drawing a spiral galaxy. It's because it's more interesting the, to draw than just a blob of light. A giant elliptical galaxy like the one on the left here can be similar in mass to the Milky Way, or in the case of this particular example, 10 times the amount of mass in the Milky Way. We can also have smaller galaxies that are still basically just a cloud of stars that are just a hazy, um, bright object. But elliptical galaxies do not have a flat plane that all of the stars orbit in. Instead, all of their orbits are kind of all over the place and chaotic, like the stars in our halo of the Milky Way. We saw um, diagrams of the standard disk orbits of stars and the more chaotic bulge and halo orbits of stars in our galaxy. It's worth noting that no category system is going to perfectly encapsulate everything. The large and small Magellanic clouds are both dwarf irregular galaxies. In this picture here, this is a picture taken in the southern hemisphere. In the skies from Grand Rapids, we would not be able to see these structures. But this is the Large Magellanic Cloud, and this is the Small Magellanic Cloud. Both of these are objects that are not inside the Milky Way galaxy. They are outside of it, but they are orbiting the Milky Way galaxy. They are in what's called the local group of galaxies, our kind of neighborhood. They are called dwarf galaxies because both of them individually have less than a billion stars. And they are called irregular galaxies because there is gas and dust in them, but they don't have a flat disk. There's just not enough mass for them to have been kind of forced into a flat disk. And they certainly don't look like 
an elliptical galaxy either. Um, they've got a kind of clear but distinct shape to them. It's worth noting that this slide summarizes the big differences, but it's more useful to be able to look at a galaxy and kind of recognize if we're seeing gas and dust or not. If we are seeing the effects of ongoing star formation, that means we either see very young blue stars, and so the, there's blue light that we can collect, or we're seeing emission nebula, which form around young O and B stars. And with spiral galaxies, there's a disk structure. Elliptical galaxies don't have net rotation, and so they just have a big blob of stars that all go around the center. One of the other things to note is um, you will sometimes see images like this of what's called the tuning fork diagram or Edwin Hubble's classification scheme. When Edwin Hubble made this kind of diagram initially, he thought it was an evolution path, that galaxies start out with no structure as ellipticals and then either form spiral arms or form barred spiral structure. But it is absolutely not an evolution path. An elliptical galaxy cannot just become a spiral galaxy. Elliptical galaxies have no gas or dust. There is no way for them to all of a sudden gain some. And if we have a large elliptical galaxy with all sorts of random orbits, it is now fully formed and stable. There's no way to flatten it, it out to make a disk-like structure. A single galaxy on its own will not turn from one type to another. However, a merger of two similar sized galaxies will almost always result in elliptical galaxy because the gas and dust is either formed into stars or lost in the collision process. And any two galaxies, whether they were two spirals or two ellipticals or a spiral and elliptical, if they're similar in mass, they basically come together and lose any net rotation they might have had and create a big blob of stars forming an elliptical galaxy. So that is one way for stars to go from one, sorry, from, for galaxies to go from one type to another is through a merger, but not just by their own waiting long enough to turn from one to another. That doesn't happen the way that Edwin Hubble thought it did. Now, Andromeda and the Milky Way are on a collision course with each other. We mentioned that briefly at the end of chapter 25. In about 3 billion years, they will start this process of creating a giant elliptical galaxy. And both of them are really the main masses in what our local cluster of galaxies is often called the local group. We will have a, a separate video going through the galactic address that we have um, a little bit later, but it's worth recognizing that there are a lot of small galaxies, dwarf galaxies, in our general neighborhood, but it's really just the Milky Way and Andromeda that are the large-scale ones. Okay, so because we have been learning so many different structures and so many different size scales, we do want to take a step back and make sure that we are fully processing the big picture. So I have a question for you that includes, again, the previous slide, this new definition of local group is the whole picture that we're seeing here, many different galaxies together. With that in mind, I want you to go through and list the objects here, which is listed correctly from largest object to smallest object. So pause and think about it. All right. So first of all, as we go through these, because a local group is a cluster of many galaxies, it must be larger than a single galaxy. So right away, we have to throw out options three and four because they put galaxy larger than local group. So three and four are gone. And if we picked one of those, then we do need to write down very clearly in our notes what a local group, what that phrase is. It is a specific structure, which is the local cluster of galaxies that we're a part of. All right, and then option two here 
if we forgot about what globular clusters are, then we might have thought cluster of galaxies, but a globular cluster is a um, cluster of stars. The Milky Way galaxy contains about 150 of these globular clusters. We talked about that in previous videos. And so if a galaxy contains globular clusters, then it cannot possibly be smaller than a globular cluster. So two is also out and we're left with one. So just to confirm that it makes sense to us, a local group is many different galaxies, and so then a galaxy would be smaller than that. We have many different nebula within our galaxy, so a nebula is smaller. And then to really hit home the fact that a nebula is bigger than a star, we think about the star formation process we talked about in chapter 21. A cloud of gas and dust collapses to form a star, which means the cloud of gas and dust was bigger then the star, it gets smaller in order to make. So option one here is the correct one. And then another question for us, a galaxy that appears to be populated by mostly red stars, what is likely true about it? So again, pause the video as long as you need to. Okay, let's go through these top to bottom and see whether they make sense to us or not. Because one thing that I try to remind us of, but it's, Never too many times that you can hear this. Critical thinking is about not just did the answer come out of my brain right away, but what can I remember that will rule out wrong answers? Critical thinking means we're not trying to memorize stuff. We're trying to understand whether a statement makes sense or not. So option one, never had blue stars in the galaxy. That shouldn't make sense to us because never have we said that galaxies can choose what type of star they want to make. They're going to make all the different types of stars. Option two, had blue stars that are not present anymore, but were at one time long ago. Let's take a step back and think about this. If we compare main sequence stars, blue and red, blue stars are the very bright, very hot, and very massive stars and red stars are the very dim, very cold, very low mass main sequence stars. High mass stars die first. Answer two here makes sense because those blue stars died first. Option three, has been around long enough for blue stars to all evolve into the red main sequence stars we see. If you picked option three, then I very much need us to go back and make sure that we understand stellar evolution. Maybe rewatch the deeper look video for the HR diagram. When stars run out of fuel in their core, they leave the main sequence and go into the upper right portion of the HR diagram. They become red giants or super giants, and then high mass stars explode as supernova. They don't evolve up and down the main sequence at all. Option four, that these galaxies somehow never contained enough gas to have blue stars develop is just a somewhat sciencier version of option one that we've already ruled out, so that's gone. And then option five, has blue stars that are being blocked by dust. Astronomers can still figure out how dust works and use other wavelengths to find stars that are blocked by dust. And so five doesn't make sense either. So the option two here is the correct one. So we will have further activities beyond these lecture videos, worksheets, animations, a couple of other um, videos to go along with this to help make sure we understand galaxy types and these different structures that we're starting to think about on the large scales. Um, and as always, when there are um, supplementary exercises from published workbooks. I try to include them so that if you if you're using these, you can follow along with them. I will see you in the next video.